to the Connect studio at Enlit Europe. I'm Pamela Larg, and today I'm joined by Kirsty Gogan, founder and managing partner at Terra Praxis. Kirsty, would you like to join me on stage? Welcome. Would you like to take a seat? Thanks. Great to be here. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Uh, let's dive straight into the important topic. Winter is almost here in full force. Mm. Uh, it's quite a tricky time to navigate in terms of the energy sector and supply without Russian gas. Mm. How important is nuclear power at this time? What is, what is nuclear's role? Well, we do have quite a large nuclear fleet in mm. Europe, um, thankfully. And, you know, one of the very helpful things about nuclear energy is that mm. once those plants are built, they do have quite low operating costs and they're incredibly reliable. Yes. Um, so they have a high capacity factor, which means that they operate, you know, almost all the time, more than 90% of the time. Yeah generating zero carbon electricity, mm -hmm. which can of course then be used by households and businesses mm. uh, really just when we need it. So having that sort of low cost, reliable and clean energy is really what Europe needs right now. Absolutely. Kirsty, are you seeing an increased positive sentiment from mm. the public towards nuclear? And in your opinion, is this reflected by policy makers at all? Yeah, I mean, we have seen really a big shift. I would say that the shift even started back in 2018 mm -hmm. when the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, published its, um, its really quite landmark, you know, report raising the alarm, you know, more urgently than ever about the lack of progress on climate change. Mm -hmm. Um, at that point, people really started to question whether or not the strategies that we'd been pursuing were going to do us get us all the way to zero whether they were actually going to be enough um, even though we'd had success driving down costs and increasing rates of deployment for renewable energy we weren't bending the curve on carbon emissions reduction and we're still not doing that but then of course after we came out of the covid pandemic what we saw was you know a sort of surge in economic activity that drove gas prices you know to record highs at yeah. the time it's hard to even remember that from last year yeah. um, and then, of course, now the Russian invasion um, of Ukraine has led to this current energy, pri energy crisis that we're in. Mm -hmm. And all of these factors combined, the, the combination of you know, concerns about affordability, uh, concerns about climate change, and now increasingly concerns about cost of living and, and energy security are all driving really unprecedented levels of support for nuclear energy, demand, I would even say, for nuclear energy. We're seeing, even in Germany, here we are in Germany, at, uh, at Enlit in Frankfurt, um, we're seeing 82% of the population here in Germany looking for you know, the prolonged operation of nuclear plants, which would have been unthinkable even several months ago or a year ago. But we're seeing that trend um, across many countries in Europe, in Sweden, in Poland, in Finland, even in the UK, and of course in Central and Eastern Europe, where there is a big dependence on Russian gas. We're seeing a lot of public support, and that is indeed translating into support from political leaders and policymakers. Although, of course, interestingly, the policymakers and the political leaders can sometimes lag behind public opinion. That is very interesting indeed. <laughs> and, and fantastic that you mentioned uh, Germany as a segue into my next question, because what is the current situation in Germany? It's obviously, it's quite a, a hot topic, perhaps <laughs> controversial. Uh, but is there a turnaround in terms of nuclear? And, you know, what, what is the activity? Are, are plants going to come back online? Or, you know, is there more support from, from the regulatory side, from policymakers in Germany specifically? Yeah, I mean, three more plants were due to close at the end of this year. And it does now seem likely that those plants will continue to operate into next year. You know, given the sort of the reality bite yeah. factor here that actually, you know, when you know, the government is facing the possibility of, bla of blackouts. You know, the government really has one job and that's to keep the lights on. And of course, you know, it's not just households who are exposed to the risk of, of power shortages, but it's businesses in the whole economy that would be really badly affected if that were to happen. So, you know, it's time now for political leaders to have mm -hmm. to, they're forced to really make tough choices. Um, and I think across Europe, where there has been a sort of an assumption that our so-called clean energy transition 
would actually have a lot of cheap subsidized Russian gas, you know, inherent in the in our energy system, you know, is now being called you know, cast into doubt. And that's certainly happening here in Germany. Um, where I think also the population are not only concerned about affordability and energy security, but also the realities of the continued dependence on coal. Um, most recently, you know, the electricity map, which shows the carbon intensity of live electricity generation across Europe, shows that um, that Germany's not only burning coal, it's actually burning lignite, and that is really carbon intensive. So today, when I was looking at the carbon intensity of the German energy system, it was more than 800 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. That's really high when our target has to get down below 50 grams. That is quite a statistic that you <laughs> that you mentioned there. And uh, I think, you know, m there are people who suggest you know, with our focus on clean energy, mm. is nuclear really the cleanest fuel source that we can turn to? Your opinion is that it is indeed a clean energy. And can you maybe talk to us uh, a little bit more about uh, nuclear's role in decarbonization? Yeah, I mean, it's... Um it's uh, it's it's not just my opinion, but you know, interestingly, yeah. when the um, the big question of whether nuclear energy should be considered a sustainable energy source was mm. being investigated by the European Commission's um, you know independent scientific advisory committee, the the Joint Research Committee, um, what they found was, and this is like an 800-page report by highly credible you know yes. scientific experts. Mm. Their findings were that nuclear energy is sustainable on every single metric in terms of energy use, in terms of land use and water use, and in terms of carbon emissions. Nuclear energy pretty much outperforms any other kind of energy source, which is pretty incredible because it's certainly not the reputation that the technology has. Um, and I think a lot of people are, myself included, beginning to look again at nuclear energy um, in light of the sort of multiple crises that we face. Um, and seeing some of these benefits that nuclear can bring in terms of having a very small environmental footprint, in terms of having a very high energy density, enabling you know, really large amounts of energy generation with a very small environmental footprint. So you can power a civilization and you can also protect nature. Um, in terms of the question of whether it's clean, I guess the, maybe what you're kind of alluding to here is you know, the spent fuel and the waste streams. Well. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the, the bottom line is that we're really good at containing it. It's the, the spent fuel is incredibly well managed. Um, the Joint Research Committee concluded it's never, harmed, it's never harmed anybody. It's never caused a risk really to the environment. Um, it's turned into glass and then sits, you know, cooling down in a copper canister. And, um, uh, and that's the end of it, unlike um, some of our other Gener electricity generators like coal plants, for example, where unfortunately their waste streams are just pumped out into the atmosphere, causing you know a lot of public health damage as well as, of course, climate change. Interestingly, if if coal plants were regulated to the same extent that nuclear plants are, then they'd be illegal. That is a fascinating <laughs> thought. Good heavens. Let's say, for example, or should I say, let's say we, we move forward with nuclear power um, as a clean energy source. Do you think that our supply chain is going to be interrupted, um, perhaps, you know, without, with Russia out of the way or, you know, in terms of, of maintenance or fuel supply or perhaps new generation technologies? If Russia's removed from the supply chain, are, are we going to feel it? Yeah, I mean, it's it is interesting the way in which the um, the Russian industry has you know knitted itself into um, the uh, the ecosystem um, for indeed our supply chain um, across across Europe and, and indeed the world um, with in kind of a low profile way. Um, so uh, actually, many people haven't really been fully aware of the extent to which we do depend upon, you know, Russian supply chains. Um, and obviously, fuel is a great example. The the um, the provision of the of Halu fuel, of, upon which many of the advanced uh, reactor vendors are um, de are going to depend, um, is something that's only really produced in Russia. So you know, th that's prompting um, the US and Europe in particular to really think about establishing those kinds of fuel supply systems. But it can take a long time to stand up 
that kind of um, supply chain. And it requires a lot of investment at a time when there's many, many other calls on you know, government money and public funds. Um, so it is going to be challenging. And I think we haven't fully realized the extent of the impact that we might yet continue to see. Absolutely. Hopefully, it would stimulate the development of the supply chain around the world. And I'm sure it and will. perhaps ultimately there'll be less reliance at the end of the day on Russian supply. Uh, but like you say, a great deal of investment required for that. Uh, Kirsty, something that was quite interesting was that you you attended COP27 this year. Yeah. And I'd be interested to, to know, how was the event for you? <laughs> what were your key takeaways? Uh, you know, there was the first nuclear pavilion, yeah. uh, which was really great to see at COP. And, uh, you know, just to understand what, you know... There were promises made at COP26. Where are we in terms of those promises being delivered? So it would be it would be great to hear your your opinion and takeaways on that. Yeah, sure. And actually, sorry, just to go back one second to the previous point about you know the the sort of ripple effect from these shocks. Mm. You know, the last time there was a major energy crisis in the 70s, France built more than 50 reactors in 15 years. You know. So you know, it is difficult to anticipate, to predict exactly what the effect of this global energy crisis will be, um, but we would expect to see some fairly major consequences. So, you know, and actually quite significant things can happen in quite a short period of time. So we'll, let's, let's see how we respond. You know, the COVID pandemic, for example, um, you know, was treated like a global emergency. And the result of that was that we collapsed the time scale to bring the vaccine mm -hmm. to market from what usually would take 10 years to just 10 months. Um, so, you know, we can really mobilize in response to a crisis, in response to an emergency. And it will be interesting to see at what point we start treating the climate emergency like it's an emergency and how we really might mobilize in response. So that brings me back to your question about, yeah. about the COP. I would say that we're certainly not yet treating the climate emergency as though it's an emergency. I still felt, um, you know, that there is, um, that these conferences uh, can be a bit flat um, and particularly when promises are made and then, you know, just a short year later, everyone, you know, admits that the promises ha are not being kept um, at, at 20, uh, in 2015 at the Paris Climate Conference when a hundred billion dollars of climate uh, mitigation aid was was pledged by the developed economies to the developing world. That money has still not been delivered, and that was one of the big themes at COP27. You know, the loss and damage that's already being felt by um, by the global South, um, experiencing exposed to major climate impacts, and yet and yet without the energy infrastructure needed for resilience to deal with those impacts, um, it's, it's increasingly apparent that the developed world not only has to take responsibility for the, that damage that's been caused and support the global south in building their resilience to cope with those impacts, but also go faster in our own decarbonization. You know, the developed world that has emitted the historical, you know, lion's share of carbon emissions. Um, however, there was, um, you know, some good positive steps, which is that, you know, nuclear energy is now becoming more mainstream in the climate conferences when, you know, five years ago it was a complete taboo and, ex and excluded entirely. Um, I think it's going to be interesting to see when it flips and everyone just forgets that nuclear energy used to be controversial and excluded. <laughs> because it's so normalized and yeah. part of the mainstream. Well, we can only hope <laughs> that uh, we will eventually make our, our way towards that. Uh, one final question, uh, Kirsty, as nuclear becomes more mainstream, perhaps, you know, there's a lot of attention on small modular reactors. There's a lot of new, exciting technology coming to the fore. Mm. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think it, it will become more mainstream? Is it is it really more affordable? Is it going to make a, an impact on the sector? Yeah, I think um, I think what's really interesting is that, you know, as the discussion around climate um, becomes more urgent, um, there's also recognition that we have to look beyond the power sector and decarbonize the other 80% of the energy 
that we that we use um, decarbonize the whole of our global energy infrastructure in 27 years by which is where you know how much time we have till 2050 and then also meet rising global energy demand which means massively expanding our global energy infrastructure as well and I think that you know reality check is is prompting a more um, o more openness to a more diverse set of strategies including for technologies that can support the decarbonization of hard to abate sectors like industry and heavy transport essentially this comes down to the need for a lot of power yes for expanding electrification mm -hmm. with clean electricity but also um, the supply of emissions free heat for industrial applications in particular and hydrogen especially for again industrial applications but also to use as an ingredient in clean synthetic fuels. And it turns out that nuclear energy is really useful for those things, power and heat and hydrogen, if it can be delivered in a way that's low cost and you know with fast and very repeatable. And that's the interesting thing about these small modular reactors is that they're moving away from a kind of traditional slow construction project-based approach much more towards uh, you know, high volume manufacturing based approach made in factories, repeat, 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 you get low costs and you get a large scale deployment in a rate of deployment that's actually potentially could achieve climate scale. So I'm excited about these new technologies, partly because of what they can do, but also the way that we can deliver them. Certainly a very exciting space <laughs> and uh, one we'll be keeping an eye on. Uh, that's unfortunately all we have time for, Kirsty. But thank you so much for sharing your thank insights. You. And uh, to our viewers, thank you for joining us. Don't forget, you can catch all of the Connect uh, interviews at nlit.world.